Ladies and gentlemen, mesdames, messieurs, c'est la date de sédité. Welcome to uh, this session, um, the Middle East in 2030, geopolitical and economic perspectives. Uh, it's my pleasure. I'm sorry we're a little late, but I think lunch was too, um, first of all, delicious, too engrossing, and we started a little late. And then always very, very stimulating com uh, conversations at lunch. However, we are here at last, and uh, it's my pleasure to introduce you to Ibtissam, uh, Al Ketbi, who is the president and founder of the Emirates Policy Center. Um, next to her is uh, Bernardino Leon Gross, um, director general of the Anwar Gharesh Diplomatic Academy, and a man who was very um, involved in the Libyan settlement, which, fingers crossed, may work. We hope so. Um, and then Muna uh, Maklam Edbid, who is an Egyptian senator and who's always very, very eloquent, and who is insulted by my determination to keep it to six minutes. And next to Muna is um, Volker Petes, who is the special representative of the Secretary General for Sudan and head of the UN Integrated Transition Assistance Mission um, in Sudan. Sudan, of course, rather interesting country, and has just signed the Abraham Accords. And so the final, um, panelist is Itamar Rabinovich, well known to many of you here, who uh, has been a very distinguished um, Israeli diplomat, who was the ambassador in Washington DC, and also a very distinguished academic, and spent quite a long time in the years past negotiating with the Syria of Hafez al-Assad. So he's had his work cut out. Now, um, Yogi Berry, the American baseball player and manager famously said that it's, um, it's very difficult to make predictions, especially about the future. So we are thinking now about the next nine years, up to 2030. Now, if the past is any kind of prologue, I think we're actually in for rather a tough um, decade, because if you look at the past decade, really have the the 10 years from the uh, so-called Arab Spring, and it hasn't actually worked out very well. Um, even in Tunisia, which was hailed by many as a great success story, uh, I think you've got Chris Said now taking powers that um, disappoint those who thought that uh, Tunisia was really becoming a fully-fledged democracy. Libya, of course, we've got what is effectively a civil war. Syria. Um, still, civil war really. Idlib, for example, is not controlled yet by Bashar al-Assad regime. Iraq is, um, well, it's, it's evolving towards a better future, but it would be hard to say that it's really entirely uh, Pacific. Let's look, let's define first of all what we mean by the Middle East. I think for practical purposes we should probably go from the Atlantic Ocean, from Morocco all the way to the Gulf here, and include, obviously, Iran. Now, I think the subjects that we need to deal with is why are we in a pretty difficult situation at the moment, and what is going to be, where, what are the, the germs of optimism that we can find in the next decade? Now, Ibtisam, you have the first task and I'm serious that even though you're a charming young lady, nonetheless, if you go over six or seven minutes, I'm going to be um, firm and say, no, you've got to stop. Badly. Thank you. Uh, I hope it's working. Thank you. You know, uh, they call me the general because I'm very firm. Excellent. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, also, I have uh, a mission impossible, they call it, how to wake up those uh, whom they are just came from, uh, from lunch. Well, I, I look at it on, on general, on the Middle East, that the, the, the geopolitical and, and uh, economic characteristic in the Middle East uh, uh, during the ongoing decade, uh, 2021, uh, 2030, are likely to be significantly governed by, by the following realities. First, the post-COVID uh, scenarios and its economic 
uh, and security fallouts. Second, the dynamics arising from uh, U.S. declining presence and involvement in the Middle East, leading to uh, questions over the possible uh, uh, emergence of collective security uh, structure in the Gulf region and, and beyond. Uh, the regional security uh, arrangements and the geopolitical and economic competition in the East Mediterranean, the Red Sea, uh, and the Arabian Sea would also uh, be critical factors. The third is the uh, preparing for the post-oil uh, era it includes uh, uh, prioritizing the, the agenda of combating climate change challenges. It will also uh, uh, raise a question related to the shifts uh, in the social contract in the Gulf countries in the post-oil rentier uh, policies. Also uh, aligned to this reality are the requirements imposed by these policies to manage the public sphere. A question about uh, linking enti uh, entitlement for citizens which achievement and uh, productivity uh, and the subsequent changes in the, in the war culture and conditions. Fourth, the extent of the growing Sino American trade uh, and geopolitical uh, competitions impact on the Middle East and the regional countries response to the new Cold War would also be uh, important uh, development. Uh, moreover, uh, are we going to witness a multi-lateral uh, 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 international uh, order and, and, and severe international uh, polarization? Uh, if yes, would uh, uh, they foil attempts by US allies in the, in the Gulf the Arab region uh, and other countries in the region to establish some balance, such a, a policy would diversify current uh, strategic options in a trade with China or Russia. This raises uh, the question whether the Middle East uh, would witness post-Washington uh, allies attempt to strike a, a, a relative balance between uh, the U.S. and other great powers. This is what we will see in this uh, decade. Also, fifth, considering the decline of political Islam in Morocco, Tunisia, Sudan, Jordan, and other countries. Now, it's likely that this decade, or at least part of it, uh, would become the post-political Islam Phase. Uh, however, no strong indications suggest that Middle East countries and societies are prepared to overcome the identity crisis. Hence, uh, the entanglement of security, economy, and politics with history, religion, identity questions are highly likely to uh, continue and build societal uh, agreement on laws system and the management of public sphere and the system of rights and freedom. All this is linked to a single question. Will Middle Eastern countries become more stable or prone uh, to conflict? Have lesson been learned from the past two decades? If the decline of political Islam continues, what domestic alternatives will replace it? Would these alternatives be able to tackle uh, the multiple structure uh, problem in running uh, public affairs in, in the region? These are the questions. How many minutes I have? Uh, you got another two. Two? Okay. Now You could stop now if you want to. It's up to you. It's okay. I, I will stop here and, and I will... Uh, sure, Akid. Okay. If you, okay. It's okay. Yeah, we'll just we come I, back. I, I bet you save my two minutes later. Okay, exactly. Thank Perfect. You. And actually, I'm very pleased that, first of all, first of all the post-political Islam idea, it's very, very interesting. 
because we heard, I think, in the Afghanistan panel before lunch that uh, Al-Qaeda and uh, Islamic State are by no means dead and could be reviving. But as you say, the, the, what has happened in Morocco is actually very encouraging. And you also mentioned the, the post-oil, which reminds me of that um, famous saying by Juan Pablo Pérez Alfonso, 1975. He was a Venezuelan oil minister. And he said, um, I call petroleum the devil's excrement. A very colorful phrase, but of course has quite a lot of force because if you think of outsiders' influence and, and interventions in the Arab world and in Iran, an awful lot of it has been because of oil and gas and the, 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 the struggle to control them. So. Um, the past has been quite complicated, but we are perhaps moving towards a past oil era. Yes. Yeah. I, 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 long time I wrote a, an article that said, uh, is oil a bless or a curse on the, on yeah. the GCC? Yeah, exactly. Now, I don't want people on the panel to get too relaxed by me going one after the other. So, Itamar, now the floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, in... In, in past years, I've dealt several times in an effort to, to do forecasting. And we try to develop a methodology. Um, because there is a normal tra a tendency among experts and others to, to simply assume that current trends will continue. But you know that uh, surprises happen when a trend breaks and there is a fundamental shift. The trick, of course, is to identify which trends will continue and which will stop uh, dramatically at, uh, at some point. So I'll, I'll try some of that towards the end of my initial comments. But I'd like to look at the dominant trends in the Middle East in the past few years and see whether they will continue or not. So what do we have? We have, in a way, the post-Arab Spring, something that Ibtissam referred to in, in a different way. The underlying social and political unrest, economic aggravation that led to the outburst of the Arab Spring were defeated uh, in the middle of the previous century, but they did not disappear. They are still there. The unrest is still there. And uh, I assume that it will continue during the coming decade. It, it may burst out in this or that place. But it will continue, it will remain a defining uh, element of the Middle Eastern scene. Uh, second is the rise of the two regional superpowers, uh, or regional pow uh, major powers, Iran and Turkey. It was not the case decades ago, it has been the, the case with Iran, say, uh, beginning in 79, with Turkey beginning in the first decade of this century, but now, uh, these two uh, states with a population of about 90 million, strong economies, strong armies, and a desire to revive a glorious imperial past, seeking hegemony or partial hegemony in the Middle East. And it's, it's been, of course, a major defining force. And I think it will, uh, it will continue. Uh, third, we have the uh, shift away, uh, pivoting away of the United States uh, from the region, which began dramatically with uh, Obama, continued in different ways uh, under Trump, and of course just had a, a dramatic uh, <coughs> manifestation uh, in, uh, in Afghanistan. Um, I think it, it, it will continue. It, may, it might be moderated to some extent because the Middle East is not a, an area that you can just ignore. Even if the Asia-Pacific area uh, becomes uppermost on your mind, you cannot neglect the Middle East. As somebody once said after 9-11, if you do not visit the Middle East, the Middle East will visit you. So I don't think the United States would be able to, to afford a, a complete uh, departure or exit. Uh, it will have to, uh, to find a way to, to live with a continuing presence uh, in, the, uh, in the Middle East. The other pole of, of this development is the return of, of Russia. I think it was underplayed by Vitaly Naumkin earlier uh, today. I think their appearance uh, in, in Syria 
the deciding element in enabling Bashar al-Assad to remain in power, of course, in partnership with Iran, the, the, the games they play in, in Libya and, uh, and elsewhere, they, they are here. And, of course, China. China, until now, has been interested in the Middle East more in economic and infrastructure terms. It has not sought military presence or di diplomatic might. I think what we may see uh, later in this decade is a, an assertion of, uh, uh, of China's growing influence. Finally, the, uh, the Arab-Israeli, and I may say uh, Israeli-Palestinian issue. What has been happening is a telescopization of the Arab-Israeli conflict into uh, an Israeli-Palestinian conflict. Uh, it, it, it is being uh, modulated. I think the Abraham Accords, what is happening among 20% of Israel's Arab population, the tendency to join Israeli society and politics. We now have, for the first time, an Israeli-Arab-Palestinian party in the government coalition. All this means that uh, the issue is there and it, it, it could be exacerbated. There could be further escalations of, uh, uh, of violence, uh, primarily with, with Gaza. Perhaps if the Palestinian Authority collapses, another form of an intifada I absolutely cannot be, uh, uh, cannot be uh, ruled out. And the Arab-Israeli, what you used to call the Arab-Israeli conflict, has become hybrid. Say, more and more Arab states want to normalize, but the Palestinian issue is here to, to stay, and the region will have to find a way of, of living with this, uh, uh, this more complex uh, uh, reality. So, uh, wh where the trends, I think, could be, could be broken, uh, where there could be definitely the, uh, a collapse of one of the uh, Arab listen regimes. Uh, there could be another round of Palestinian-Israeli fighting, and the, the, the uh, competition, uh, the conflict between Israel and Iran over the nuclear issue and over what Iran is building in Syria could lead to another serious armed collision, and that collision would not be limited to just one country. A war in the north, on the northern front of Israel, would include Lebanon and Syria and Iran. It's going to be a uh, a massive event if it uh, uh, if it happens. So, not uh, not necessarily a very optimistic uh, outlook. But who in the Middle East can afford to be optimistic? Thank you very much. Um, it's interesting that both Ibtisam and well, Ibtisam, you refer to the post-oil era, and of course, the title of um, of this session is actually uh, not just on the geopolitics, but also the economics. And, of course, our neighbor here, Saudi Arabia, has famously got its Vision 230. And Dubai, of course, has this 10 times concept and so on. I mean, there is, I think, a desire throughout the Arab world to try to think of, uh, of an economic future which, goes, which is somehow separate from all the political pressures, which seem to be ever-present and probably ever-permanent. But let's put that aside for the moment and switch now to Bernardino, um, who had a lot to do with the Mediterranean. And I seem to remember that the EU has been promising um, a Mediterranean strategy for at least three decades now. And the idea being that the North would help uh, the South develop, etc. And it doesn't seem to me really to have worked. And you more recently have been involved in Libya, getting the UN settlement there, which I guess is holding for the moment. So what's your perspective for the next, for this coming, for the decade to 2030? Merci bien. Euh, Permettez-moi d'abord de remercier Thierry de Montbrial et son équipe à Alifri euh, pour euh, euh, une conférence qui est déjà un grand succès. Et... Ebtesan, uh, don't worry, I will speak in French. I just wanted to, to thank uh, Thierry. <laughs> so I think that, uh, you know, making predictions in, in this region is always difficult, and normally predictions are not very accurate. Uh, um, but if I think of three factors that will be important in the coming 10 years, 
I would uh, focus uh, on uh, demography, on power, and on technology. I think uh, uh, these are three elements, and each one of them with a correcting or an influencing sub-factor. Um, demography, let us think that one-third of the population in this region are between 15 and 30 years, yeah. and another third is below 15. Yeah. This, this gives you, this gives us an idea of where we are, and uh, it means that these two thirds of the population in the region, uh, in 10 years, will be the uh, core, uh, the mainstream. And you were asking us to reflect on where economy and politics meet. This is not people who are expecting big changes uh, or who will have big expectations politically. The region is what it is. Uh, but this is people that will expect to have jobs, to have food, to have a life. And what happens when you cannot offer that? And the region has been struggling, uh, you remembered, before when I was dealing with the Arab Spring, and we always considered the Arab Spring as the consequence of, uh, of the 2008 crisis. Always when you have big financial crisis, remember Algeria in the 90s, yeah. we had the bread revolt, and then the, the uh, elections. And, uh, so demography is going to be a huge factor, and I would say the main one in the coming 10 years. Uh, affecting uh, and influencing at the same time economic issues and political issues. What is the sub-factor here which uh, is important to, to bear in mind? Migration. Yeah. This will produce huge migration waves. This is, first of all, a loss of talent for the region. But it is also a, an element that will impact what others may do. For instance, the European Union, you were asking about Europe, and unfortunately many people in Europe can see only the migration dimension when they look at the South. So this will be an important factor influencing what others may do. Number two, power. It has been said before uh, by people who know about this much more than I do, about Eptisan, uh, and Itamar uh, 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 described what the big powers will do. So we will see two interesting factors. One is that the local powers in the region will be more active, will have to be more active, because we have the, in the US living, the Russians will not have the same capacity as the United States, the Chinese even less. Uh, in this region, if you don't, if you are not ready, if you're not a power ready to send an army, forget about it. Drones and technology will not replace an army. Who is ready in the world today to send an army to the Middle East? No one, except local yeah. powers. That's that's the. Uh, so we will see the peripheric powers, non-Arab powers like. Uh, Iran, which has always uh, been there, as you said before, but we will see more Turkey and Israel uh, playing a role in the region together with countries like uh, Saudi Arabia, like uh, Egypt, like the UAE, etc. So we'll see more of, of local engineering in, in the region. And I think uh, all of them will be more pragmatic in the future. Yeah. Uh, uh, Iran is a country which has a foreign policy which is about regime survival, yeah. about the Shia communities in the region, whereas Turkey or Israel are more pragmatic. I think they are not about regime survival. They, they have other concerns, and, and I think that's interesting. Um, number three, technology. It's been said this decade we will see the uh, paradigm of oil as dominating uh, uh, energy around the world changing. Most of us will use electric cars in 10 years, even if we now don't imagine that. Yeah. So the, the region will have to change. What is interesting is that the region is already technology producer. It's not anymore depending on, on others. 
it's, it's not easy to predict what technology will do. I remember 10 years ago, people were saying, oh, digital, digital is going to transform the region because you know, these young kids with their phones, they will organize revolutions with the digital. What we see today is that digital is the tool that uh, authoritarian regimes are using to control their population. So it's not easy to predict, but I think that when we see countries in the region uh, going to space, uh, uh, being in very important actors in uh, renewable energies, uh, technology can provide solutions for many of the problems we're discussing today. Food, jobs, e economy, going back to, to your earlier question. So I think it's a factor that will be more and more playing a positive role because necessarily they will have to, to replace oil. Let me make a final point, uh, and it's not exactly technology, but it's, it's something that home ground can be very positive, which is diplomacy. This region has been an importer of diplomacy always. You know, the big designs, the big game, the, the, the uh, UN resolutions. Uh, yeah. Now, this region already for a while has been producing excellent diplomacy. Yes. We go back to the Saudi plan for the yeah. Israeli Arab. Uh, uh, what the UE has been doing in the Horn of Africa, Ethiopia, with uh, the, the Qataris in, in Afghanistan. So we have more and more diplomacy. And in the coming 10 years, we will see more diplomatic initiatives from the region and less from outside. And I think this will also be good news for the region. That's a very interesting point. Yeah, I haven't thought of that, but very interesting. Your, your point about demography actually is the perfect segue into Muna. Muna, you are from the, the Arab world's most populous country. I think Nabil Fahmi said today that um, it's 104 million people and it'll be rather more by the time he'd finished speaking. And of course, <laughs> uh, Egypt has lots and lots of economic problems. Um, what's your perspective for the next few years? Six minutes, Mona. No. <laughs> <laughs> so, at the risk of losing one minute from my dictator friend, John Andrews, I would like to thank and to tell the WPC how, what a pleasure it is to be back at this meeting after this horrible two years that we stayed confined. But I must say that some things haven't changed and most, most notably the seminal role of WPC as a forum for serious foreign and security policy thinking. So I really want to heartily applaud uh, President Thierry de Montbrial for providing a much needed setting to discuss the most poignant political matters as we know. Merci Thierry, merci à toute la bande qui est avec lui. And I would like to share some thoughts on where the Middle East will be in 2030. And I will be, I'll focus particularly on Egypt. Très bien dit. We can give you that uh, 90 seconds. That's very good. Oh, okay. Yeah. Well yeah. deserved. Due to the shortness of time, because of my dictator friend, <laughs> I will focus on three issues related to Egypt's vision 2030. One is the historic strategy for human rights, a word that was taboo until lately, that was inaugurated a month ago by President Abdel Fattah el-Sisi. The second is the impact of COVID-19 on Egypt. And third, the, the chances of Egypt becoming a regional gas hub in the Eastern Mediterranean. We've talked about how important energy is and will be. So I think I will start by the third one, in case my friend stops me. <laughs> so my last issue is on energy. What are the chances of Egypt being a regional gas hub in the Eastern Mediterranean by 2030. I would say that the access to energy resources has unquestionably long been a driver for foreign policy. Therefore, the challenge for any state is working out how to use energy as a geo-economic asset and to successfully turn it into both a source of income and of state power. And this is exactly what uh, Egypt's leadership is doing. 
Now, Egypt faces many challenges, as you know, both internal and external, including soaring inflation, a current currency crash, subsidy cuts, and water more expensive. So um, unemployment in Egypt and the Arab world is likely to remain high as millions more young people stream into a very strained job market. But now there is a ray of hope emerging, and it comes in the form of a windfall natural gas discovery with the potential to boost Egypt's limping economy and build a new commercial alliance with Eastern Mediterranean countries and Israel. Egypt struck the jackpot in, 12, in 2015 with the discovery of a giant reservoir known as Zohra, which has developed into one of the largest single gas fields in the Middle East. In 2018, Egypt, Greece, Cyprus, and Israel agreed to establish an East Mediterranean gas forum whose headquarters is in Cairo. In August 2019, production on the Zohra field, the largest gas discovery ever made in Egypt and the Mediterranean, reached more than 2.7 BCFD. The discovery will allow the country to transition from being an importer of natural gas to an exporter. Now, what are Egypt's advantages? What does it have to offer? Egypt has li liquefaction capacities that give it a strategic advantage. Furthermore, Egypt's geographical location straddling Africa, the Middle East, and the Eastern Mediterranean, and having access to two seas and the Suez Canal is undeniably a good basis for becoming a gas hub, provided the country has significant gas reservations. Reserves. I, interestingly, Egypt's hopes of being a future gas hub are shared by the European Union, which aims to diversify its own energy supply and which considers Egypt a potential partner. <coughs> the main challenge that Egypt faces is again, as was very well said, its overpopulation, which further fuels energy demands and the country's population has reached over 104 million and ex is expected to reach, John Andrews, 120 million, 28 million by 2030. So the projected population growth will lead to a considerable increase in electricity demand, and thus the power sector will need more gas in the future. On the other hand, Egypt should continue its efforts to offer an appealing business climate for, for foreign companies to attract further investment. I have an article on this subject, if anybody is, is interested, in the Cairo Review of Global Affairs at American University, published by the School of Global Affairs, which is headed by our friend, uh, Minister Nabil Fahmi. <coughs> now, let me go to the second issue, if I have time, and that, that is the human rights development. Last month, Egypt saw the launch of the new national strategy of human rights, stipulating a set of government commitments to improve elements of socio-economic, cultural, and political rights. As you know, Egypt has very often been criticized all over in Western press and the Western uh, lobbies and uh, human rights community because of its human rights. Now, what we hope this strategy will be, it will give access to job opportunities, education, healthcare, and religious freedoms. As you know, religious tolerance has been one of the mantra of President Sisi's address. Uh, solidarity and unity between Muslims and Christians. No other ruler before that has ever been to the cathedral or assisted to the a Christmas uh, mass, as he did, and nobody has given a chance to the Coptic community to have representatives in parliament, as well as to women who today are more than 50 or 60 percent of the parliament. So the document also shows 
a good commitment to improving political rights, and this is what is missing. However, <coughs> on this issue in particular, there are different reactions as the greater part of the document emphasizes more socio-economic and cultural rights. Human rights, as I said, traditionally have got a lot of world attention and criticism. And they're also sometimes brought up in high-level political talks, such as the latter uh, talks with Blinken in Egypt and the criticism of the US Congress. So Egyptian officials, for their part, particularly the security ones, have said that the country's security bodies have to face up to militant groups and therefore they, who try to provide instability. So the debate is not closed, but what counts now is the implementation of this strategy. <coughs> As the state has shown its commitment, especially within the UN Human Rights Council, to honor these obligations. And Credit goes to civil society for having secured the release of this new strategy and the release of a few prisoners. Uh, of course, some critics have called uh, the act of the strategy meaning of an act of public relation on the, public, on the part of the government. However, although the references to political rights and liberties fall short of the human rights community expectation, it must be recognized that it is the first time the government has taken upon itself the task of working towards improving these rights and liberties. And me, as a former member of the National Council of Human Rights and a human rights activist for more than 20 years, I agree with some of the political analysts that looking at the glass as half full rather than half empty, as I was telling my friend Dina, is what the strategy offers, and it, as such, it offers a precedent in the sense that it is a commitment on the part of the government to working on improving the quality of human rights, including political rights and liberties. Perfect, Mara. That's six minutes, <laughs> plus the one, the 90 seconds. That's a perfect part to stop. Very good. Thank you very much. Shukla. That's I didn't wonderful. thank you yet. Well, no, no, I, but you can thank me afterwards. <laughs> Don't worry. Let me... <laughs> <laughs> we will be moving on. Uh, I still have something to say. I know, say, but, but you I'll can say, say it later, okay, yes, okay, uh, absolutely. Okay. Um, last but not least, uh, Volker Bethes, and of course, Volker, you um, are responsible for another slightly troubled part of the world, Sudan. Well, thank you, John. I, I'm not, I'm not even trying to predict the future, but I think what I do is, is I actually tell you a story about Sudan, which I think has some significant elements of possible paths forward. Now, Sudan is more influenced by African developments than by classical Middle Eastern developments, but still I think it is significant what happens in Sudan, or Sudan could be a signifier for developments in the Middle East. The revolution which we have had in Sudan in 2018, 2019, was a real revolution, by the way, um, significant in at least three aspects for this region, Middle East, North Africa. A, it was triggered by the same grievances which people had in the so-called Arab Spring. B, it was a first popular, real popular revolution against an Islamist regime. So a Muslim Brotherhood Islamists don't have to be successful in revolutions all the time. They could sometimes be at the receiving end, which was the case in Sudan. And C, the Sudanese have learned from the failures of the Arab Spring, very much very actively learned, have learned to avoid the the path of Syria or the path of Libya by agreeing and accepting a formula of power sharing between the military, the civilians, and some rebel groups that have joined the fray later. And since that revolution and the agreement on a power sharing formula, Sudan has been in a triple transformation process from authoritarianism to pluralistic democratic governance, from civil wars, basically 60 years of almost uninterrupted civil wars to domestic peace and also from economic mismanagement and high debts to economic recovery and more equitable development. Now, will Sudan succeed? I don't know. I'm just working for the success, but I don't know. I'm pretty sure it can. The Sudanese can. We are halfway through that transition period, which is supposed to end by January 2020. 
four, the record so far, as you couldn't expect otherwise, is mixed, but I would say the glass is certainly fuller than empty. Um, the record is more positive so far than negative. Peace agreements have been signed with the main rebel movements. Of course, implementation is a challenge and takes time. Uh, the economy is recovering after having been in free fall. The main difficult part, but also the most interesting dimension of this transition for this region, for the Middle East and North Africa, is a political transition. It's the most difficult, because power sharing between the military and the civilians, A, it is rather exceptional in this part of the world, both the Middle East and Africa, and also this power sharing arrangement is not a marriage of love. It's not even a marriage of convenience. It is at best a marriage of reason built of the reasonable realization that one part cannot do without the other or one part cannot do away with the other without risking the entire country and risking domestic peace. It's a messy transition and you wouldn't expect it to be otherwise and just in the last two weeks we have had a couple of attempts to reset the balance of forces in Sudan. Why is it significant for the rest of or for the Middle East and North Africa. Hey, all the elements which we have in the Sudanese microcosm, as it were, are present in this larger region of Middle East and North Africa. We have authoritarianism or the remnants of authoritarianism that resist change. We have rent-seeking dysfunctional economies that resist change and reform. We have, um, Bernardino already mentioned that, we have an extremely young population, which can be a challenge and an opportunity at the same time. And we have, and I insist on saying that because I think it is so important, we have a society that is much more connected to the world, much more technology savvy, much more open to the world than the old elites that were overthrown in the coup or first and then the revolution of 2019. So if Sudan can succeed in this transition with, with very difficult starting points economically, then I think the rest of the region can too. Which brings me to, very briefly, to the geopolitical picture. Sudan, as I said in the beginning, is much more influenced by developments in Africa, Ethiopia, Chad, South Sudan, than it is by developments in the classical Middle East. And the question for me, and it's, it's, it's probably an academic question to an extent, is whether this concept of Middle East, North Africa, um, will still be relevant in 2030? Or isn't it rather um, that we will have different sub-regions with different orientations, different levels of integration? And indeed, I think that the answer to the question of which geographical concepts or geopolitical concepts apply in 2030 lies in the patterns of integration and connectivity. So it could well be that parts of North Africa are much more part of a wider European economic space than of a MENA region. It could well be that the Gulf is a much stronger player in the Indian Ocean in Africa than in North Africa or the classical Middle East. And it could well be, and I hope it will, that Sudan will be a center of integration in East Africa. And influence, political influence, will come through connectivity and linkages rather than the traditional ways of buying off your clients in a neighboring country and subverting the neighbor if possible. So to conclude, I think the Gulf states, and since we are in the Emirates and we're happy that we're here, the Gulf states would have a great opportunity to help peaceful development, not only in Sudan, but in the entire sub-region by thinking about connectivity and linkages, by not only investing in port structures, port infrastructure, I know the UAE is doing that along the African coast, but also the linkages between the ports and the deeper inner side of Africa, as it were, by linkages through rail and road, for example, to the landlocked neighbors of Sudan, Chad, Central African Republic, South Sudan, and Ethiopia, and thereby making Sudan not only a center of integration, but also a pillar of stability and regional development. And finally, if I may, any advice to regional and international players who see that the situation in Sudan and in many other countries is still 
fluid is indeed invest geoeconomically in connectivity. It helps your economic interest and the interest of the countries you're investing in and invest politically in institutions and power sharing rather, in, rather than in trying to find your own clients or try to manipulate political outcomes. Thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed, Volker. Um, two things of surprise. Thank you. Very, very good round of opinions here. Um, I thought Itamar would be would speak rather more about the Abraham Accords, so I'm going to ask him a little bit about that. And also, um, the country that no one has really referred to, except me in passing, is Saudi Arabia, which, I mean, Egypt is the uh, most populous Arab country, but one could argue that in some ways Saudi Arabia is now the most um, activist, I suppose is a good way of putting it, um, under Mohammed bin Salman. So I just wonder, I mean, if, for example, Saudi Arabia were to sign, to join up to the Abraham Accords, that would be a huge game changer. Um, is that possible in the next, before 2030, Itamar? Yeah. <clears throat> before, I, before I respond, I'd like to make a brief comment on what uh, <clears throat> Volker has just mentioned about connectivity, or try efforts to, to change the, the traditional geography of the region. Two of these uh, aspiring regional powers, Iran and Turkey, have, have been doing that. Iran is seeking a land bridge from the eastern periphery of the region to the Mediterranean. This is a driving element of its policy to Iraq, Syria, and Syria directly, or Syria, Lebanon, and Turkey. The game they played in, Lib in Libya, the efforts to define economic uh, zones in the Mediterranean, so to block, enable to, to block the uh, laying of a pipeline for gas that Mona has spoken from Egypt or Israel to the uh, to Europe, an interesting manifestation of, of this this issue. Now to the Abraham Accords. First of all, interestingly, it's the only foreign policy success for the Trump administration. I mean, I'm a, a huge critic of the Trump administration, domestic and foreign policy, but this is something that they accomplished, and for this they deserve credit. Uh, second, from an Isra let's say Israel's point of view, it's very important. Uh, I, I, uh, I've been pleased uh, uh, during these uh, three days to hear how proud uh, UAE officials and spokespersons are of these accords as an achievement of their diplomacy, and it's a very pleasant surprise for Israelis because our uh, experience with Egypt and Jordan, the countries that had made peace with Israel before, was they were always trying to conceal it or to, to lower the profile. And here is a country very proud of, of normalizing relations with uh, Israel. Uh, I think that uh, ultimately it will prove to be, to have a very important healing effect on the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. Mm. Because, because of the conflict between Israel and the Palestinians, or the larger Arab-Israeli conflict, created somewhat of an anti-Arab feeling in Israel that is an element in fomenting right-wing politics in the country. The open, warm peace with the Emirates, with Bahrain and with Morocco now, will open up friendly environments to Israelis. There'll be COVID is now standing in the middle of that, but I think we'll begin to see a much larger movement of people to and from. Uh, there are three airlines flying between the uh, Emirates and, uh, and Israel now, several flights every day, direct flights, and to, to Morocco. And Israeli society, I think, will be changed, transformed by this contact with, uh, with Arabs who are friendly and who just want to have a normal relationship. Ultimately, it's going to affect Israeli outlook on the Palestinians. So, while the Palestinians were initially angry with the Accords, they calmed down, and I think they will realize, ultimately, that it's going actually to 
But on the on the Saudi question, as I yeah, asked, no, which you are neatly skirting around, it's the Saudis have been very helpful in in help very helpful in all of these. Bahrain would not have moved without a note from the Saudis, yeah. and the Saudis uh, opened the airspace to to these flights between the Emirates and Israel, make it much. And there was a Saudi plan back in 2000, which I can't remember, to, for the, re mutual recognition. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, Saudi. That original Saudi plan, I think, has been outdated by, by events, and Saudi diplomacy has since, uh, and since moved. But it's up to the Saudis. I think that domestically they feel that they are still not ready for, for that. No. Will they in the next nine years, and what will Saudi politics look like? Uh, how many more princes will end up in hotel prisons or prison hotels? We don't know. So. It's, it's a domestic Saudi question, it's not a okay. larger issue. Ibtisam, um, and also with the Saudi question, um, I mean, it, Saudi Arabia recently said that foreign companies setting up in the Gulf region should have their regional headquarters in Saudi Arabia rather than, as has been the custom, in Dubai, for example. That struck me as being a slightly um, unfriendly act, but they are your neighbors and friends, so what is happening? What is going to happen? First, I, I will comment on the Abraham Accord. For sure, it was a game changer in the, in the, in the region, and uh, UAU was bold uh, when it took that step now. But UAE is a small country and slim. Saudi has many constraints, okay? They are the custodian of the Holy Shrine, and they have a huge population and conservative, and some of them also uh, more fanatic Islamists, okay? It is not an easy step. Plus, they have that uh, King Abdullah initiative, okay? The two-state solution, and each of those signatories has been awarded with something. Mm -hmm. Okay, now the Saudi, if they are looking for what to be awarded, that to be uh, implement the King Abdullah initiative, uh, we know that and we heard that Netanyahu was there, okay, and met with uh, Prince Mohammed bin Salman. And it was about uh, uh, to join yes. the other. But what I said, the constraints, okay, yeah. inside, that which is still preventing, but I believe also uh, if Trump was still there, they will be going on that road because that one of the uh, Trump, what he considered a historic uh, deal yeah. he did. Okay. Well, he still thinks you may get the Nobel Prize. <laughs> we'll see if they will <laughs> consider that he deserved that. Uh, okay, now coming back to the other question, you know, we are alliance, that's right, but the, the interests are not identical. This is, this is normal in the international relations between, between the states now. Competition is open, like Sheikh Mohammed bin Rashid, he said, okay, it's there who want to compete, but at least those whom they will choose. Still, there are those major companies, they did not close their offices in Dubai. The facilities Dubai is giving, it's been giving before, is tremendous and huge. Okay, Saudi still, and I believe still, it needs a culture as well. Okay, so they, they will, but not now. I think they need, but part also of a new mm -hmm. project, this is when it has been done, the that including, resort, yeah. including Israeli there. Yes. I don't think it, it can be without them. True. No. Thank you. I'm going to come back to you all later, but we've only got 10 minutes left, so let's get some questions from the audience, please. And there are a couple of hands, because it's pretty well impossible for me to see as I gaze into the darkness here, but there are two hands up there if the microphones could come to them, and if you could say who you are. Sure. Yeah. Uh, Memduh Karakulukcu from Istanbul. I want to uh, ask Volker about Sudan. 
it fits in with the sort of model I was playing with in the morning in the panel. What, I'm, uh, what I wasn't clear is that the way you painted the picture, it sounded like on economic, political, international affairs, all three fronts, things are moving in the right direction. Is it, I mean, that may or may not be accurate, but that is the way I perceived it. Is it because the population, the elite, learned from the mistakes of others and they actually substantively are delivering on the economy, the politics, and all the rest of it? Or is it a shift of attitude? Do the people, knowing what has happened elsewhere, are they more patient? Are they more tolerant? Are they more willing to allow time for all these efforts to uh, prosper, to give it fruit. Is, 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 is it, is, am I making myself clear? Is it actually a substantive change? Because that would be excellent news that things can be around, turned around within a few years versus it takes time, but if we change attitudes in the population, then it will allow things to go in the right direction in five, 10 years. Thank you. Thank you. Volker, hold that thought and then the other question uh, in fact, there are two more. One, the, the, yes, uh, just there. Thank you very much. Yeah. I put my question now. Okay. Hervé Mariton from France. Uh, two quick questions to Madame Elkadbi. Uh, first, we're here in the Emirates, in a country with a large number of migrants. So how do you see uh, this factor evolving in the 10 years to come? I mean, the situation seems stable most of the time in most parts of the region but sometimes a bit more difficult in other countries in the Gulf. And so uh, is it something that you see as being decreased in the decade to come? Uh, is the uh, part of migrants in the country to increase? And how do you see um, the life of these migrants in the country? I mean, the, the sort of proportion of the population you have here is a sort of thing we do not know in our countries. And it is uh, something of a strange uh, reality to us, and it's a, obviously a fact, an important factor of life in your country. Thank the second you. quick question is Very that interesting question, because yeah, I, um, the question, uh, let's, basically, if you take the Gulf states, other than Saudi Arabia, um, the population is largely immigrant. I mean, for example, in the UAE, I think the, the, res the citizen population is probably, what, 10%, um, and the same really Kuwait, Bahrain, a little higher, but not, so there's a great reliance upon immigrant residents. So what is the future development of society? Did oh, I get that go. question correctly? Yeah, that, that, the question is correct. Well, yeah. how, how do you say this evolving in the 10 years to come? Yeah. Is it a factor of stability or not? And a quick uh, other question. We've not, we have not been talking a lot about Saudi Arabia, and you have corrected this. We have not been talking a lot about Qatar. And obviously Sorry, about? Qatar. Qatar, uh, yeah. And it's obviously a tricky yeah. issue in the region as well. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Uh, and then the third question, just there. It's actually a counterpart to, uh, Mr. Farid, yes. uh, to uh, Mr. Mariton's question. Do you see a role for Arab diasporas helping their home countries? Excellent. Okay, good question. Um, we have five minutes. Volker, you can start with your question. You only need a minute to answer that question. <laughs> Here we go. No, I don't think I need more. Thank you. Um, <laughs> thank you, Mamadou, for the question. Um, I didn't want to create the impression that transition is an easy ride. Every step that has been taken in Sudan has to be negotiated between these partners in that marriage of reason. And it's every step is a difficult negotiation. But to your question, sort of, is it learning or attitude? Now, it's never absolute here, but I would tend to say it is learning. It is learning from the experiences of others. I mentioned Syria, I mentioned Libya, some other experiences. But it is also learning through marching forward on that path. Learning both that you cannot have a half or a 30% transition. I mean, you cannot build peace, well, you cannot build peace without having a peace agreement, but you cannot have a peace agreement without building peace and you need an economy for that. You cannot have economic recovery 
without reintegrating with the rest of the world, and you will not be reintegrated in the rest of the world if you fall back into authoritarianism and dictatorship and defy rule of law. So everybody realizes that these dimensions are connected, and then, of course, people are learning from one another while they are moving forward. I would say, and to conclude with this, sort of on the cultural identity question, by opening up the political scene, and by concluding peace agreements, and by integrating former rebels into government, the Sudanese are also collectively realizing what pluralistic a country they actually are, and that this could be an advantage and needs to be preserved. Thank you. Um, it's the Sam. The floor is yours now. The question is if one was about uh, what is the policy, how will it evolve on immigrant residents in the Gulf states? And the second question for you really uh, is about Qatar, and I suppose um, the confrontation that existed between most of the GCC and Qatar, which is now, we hope, properly resolved. But there we are. That was, a, that was a, yeah, Qatar. Okay. Well, uh, in the beginning, I would say, uh, 80s, it was a dilemma how to manage that, okay? And, and there is a fear. And uh, try through emiratization. And then the government came to a conclusion that, well, you still need those uh, expats. And you have a small population, okay? And you are... Uh, enlarging your projects. So you have to decide. Uh, so that the decision, okay, we will have them and we will manage them well. Now we have 200 nationalities here, managing them very well. There is no conflicts. Even what happened in the 80s between the Indian and the Pakistani, it's not anymore there. Okay, engaging them that uh, uh, at the limit they feel they are part of this country, part of its stability. Uh, they fear if there's anything happened, that incident which happened that a woman has been killed that a uh, few years ago, everybody was feeling fear uh, on the stability of this country. The most uh, stable and security, uh, you will find it here and in, in, in UAE. And there is a question, of course, about the uh, salaries, whatever, but still comparing, I'm always saying, comparing with their uh, original countries, they find themselves still they are a uh, winner here. Now, on the long run, the, the latest, which has been released, that the global emirs shows that we are going in that way, uh, managing our indigenous with the other uh, nationality. And no reverse about this. No back to 80s where we say we have to preserve our uh, identity and, and no others should, we should not let the comers, we should be the majorities. Cannot be. You cannot do it anymore now. Now, regarding Qatar, I think uh, Dr. Anwar. Uh, elaborate on that, but I would say also that it's always m basically between UAE and Qatar, it's uh, uh, the differences in the vision and in the role and the way. UAE always believed on the nation state. The Qataris believed on non-state actors. And so that's two ways, one promoting nation state, the other promoting non-state actors, uh, here we are talking the Muslim Brotherhood. So two different uh, rules. Plus between the Saudi and Qatari, well, Qatari always felt a threat from Saudi, a big countries behind them. And back to the clash between the two countries in 1995, there is always concern in the mind of the Qatari's leadership that Saudi always be a threat. So you have to contain Saudi, either by being troublemakers or having a good uh, relation. Okay. 
previous, it was not a good relation. Now the Qatar is also, all of us, from that uh, rift, I would say all the countries, realize it's, it's zero-sum game. Nobody win. So that's why they came to that Al-Ula summit and how to make it win-win. And unfortunately, there's a, there are screens in front of us with big red letters saying, time up. So we start a little late, and we're going to finish um, a tiny bit late, because despite this thing, I want each of you, in 20 seconds, to say what your dream is for 2030. Itamar, now it's a dream, 20 seconds. <clears throat> dream is uh, for, for a Middle East that enables its uh, young generation uh, to, f to find home in a hospitable place. Okay, good. It's 20 seconds. Uh, Volker. A deeply integrated, deeply economically and socially integrated region that could compete with Southeast Asia. Excellent. Uh, Mona, 20 seconds. Um, a young generation that will be up to compete with the, f with the Western generation in the new technology and the digitization in all their aspirations to be uh, at, this, at, a, at a par with them. Perfect. Uh, Bernardino. Uh, is to see the young diplomats in the region uh, designing the, the plans and, and the projects that will bring peace to the region uh, around 2030. Uh, a region without conflict based on sect or ethnicity. Region with uh, empowering citizenship. Excellent. Inshallah, we, it'll all happen. Thank you very much to this panel. I think it was extremely good. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you.